through his foundation and campaigns for human rights in Britain and internationally. Born in Melbourne, Australia, Peter began campaigning for human rights aged just 15. His first campaign was against the death penalty, followed by campaigns to support Aboriginal rights and in opposition to conscription and the Australian and US war against the people of Vietnam. After moving to London, he became a leading activist in the Gay Liberation Front, organising sit-ins at pubs that refer, refused to serve pubs, and protect against police harassment and the medical, medical classification of homosexuality as an illness. For the late 1970s onwards, he called for a single, comprehensive, all-inclusive Equal Rights Act to harmonise the uneven patchwork of equality legislation to ensure equal treatment and non-discrimination for everyone. The author of over 3,000 published articles and six books, this man is a giant uh, in the world uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Peter Tatchell. Thank you very much for a very generous introduction. And um, I too have to make a clothes apology. <laughs> you will see I'm wearing the same shirt and the same tie as on question time last night. <laughs> <laughs> I've just really come straight back from Belfast um, after having been delayed by a nearly two hour, or a nearly three hour delay uh, because of all the problems that you've got. Yeah, I'm here. Um, and uh, I'm very proud to be here and to support the co op, respect the work, and check out. It's great what you're doing, it's very important what you're doing, and it's by taking the LGBT movement into all the different sectors of our society, into all different that we build a grassroots movement that can be sustained and strong. I guess for me, um, looking and reflecting <coughs> where we are today is a pretty exciting week we've just been through. Um, yet again, we got the same-sex marriage bill through Parliament uh, by 366 votes to 161, a very clear majority once again. And now, of course, the big test is the House of Lords. And it's really hard to call. I think I'd be very surprised if the House of Lords voted against, particularly with such a mandate twice from the Commons. But who knows? Who knows? So I would urge all of you, if you know any members of the House of Lords, or if you share any interest with members of the House of Lords, like maybe you work in a particular field which they have a history of, contact them, make, make that point that you have a shared interest, and engage them in that way and try and press them to support uh, equal marriage. The bill, as you know, is pretty good, but not without its flaws. It does retain the discrimination in pension entitlements, which also exist under the civil partnership legislation. So it means that same-sex partners, in the event of one partner dying, the surviving partner will only inherit the pension pay-in from the year 2005, uh, even if they've been paying into the pension pot since 1960 or 1970. So it is a, a very regrettable aspect of discrimination. In many ways, it's also very odd that the government's gone about it this way, because in essence, as I'm sure you all know, under the 1949 Marriage Act, there is no specification that marriage partners have to be male and female. The ban on same-sex marriage was only introduced in this country in 1971 under the Nullity of Marriage Act. That was the first time it became illegal for same-sex couples to marry. Um, up until that time, uh, there had been very few attempts, but there were some attempts in the late 60s and about 1970 by transgender and same-sex couples, and that's what prompted the legislation. The government of the day decided that it better close this loophole before same-sex couples and transgender people took advantage of it. Um, so it is a relatively recent, in fact only three decades old, prohibition. So the idea that this ban has been around for centuries or millennia um, is, in legal terms anyway, uh, a fiction. Um, the other element of the, uh, of the legislation, which I think it's important to bear in mind, is although religious organizations will be allowed, if they wish, to perform religious same-sex marriages, the particular restrictions are quite onerous, and many uh, faith organizations will not be able to meet the criterion. First of all, they have to apply for a special license, a 
special license for same sex marriages. I think it costs, in, there's a sliding scale of different councils are using different, different amounts, but some councils are reporting only charging £3,000 for the license, and it will be renewable every three years. Um, whereas, for a standard marriage license, once the organisation or the premises gets the license, it's there forever, and um, there's no re requirement to renew, and the actual cost is, 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 is tiny by comparison. So that's a discrimination. I think um, the other obstacle is that um, faith organisations that want to conduct same-sex marriages if they share a premises with any other faith organization, they will have to get the permission of all the other faith organizations before they can conduct those same-sex marriages. So, for example, the Metropolitan Community Church, which is very pro-LGBT and pioneered by LGBT people, uh, many of its churches share premises with a range of other religious organizations. And they've already told me that in nearly every single case they can identify, they are certain that the other faith organizations will object, and therefore they will not be able to conduct these, uh, these ceremonies, because they won't be able to get the license for the premises, even if they can afford it, because the other organizations will object. So there are some issues there, and I hope that some of these might be resolved in the House of Lords, because when we talk about marriage equality, we really do mean marriage equality. Not almost equality, we want marriage equality. Having said that, um, it is a really groundbreaking milestone piece of legislation, even for people who don't necessarily agree with marriage. You know, I share the feminist critique, I would not want to get married. I look at the patriarchal history of marriage and I think, no, 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 not for me. But, as a Democrat, I believe in the right of everyone to be equal before the law. Everyone should have that choice, that right, including the right to refuse. And if you don't have the right to accept, you don't have the right to refuse. So it's that important, fundamental democratic principle of equality before the law and allowing people to make a choice. That's why it is so important, even for people who may be critical and not sympathetic towards marriage. Um, Same-sex marriage is the last major legal inequality to overcome. But there are some smaller issues. Like, as we know, all the different equality laws that have been passed over the last decade or so, all of them have qualified, limited exemptions for faith organisations. So the laws governing workplace discrimination and discrimination in the provision of goods and services, they all have some qualified exemptions for religious bodies if those bodies can demonstrate that uh, the uh, discrimination <coughs> is necessary to uphold their religious ethos. Now, it's very limited, but I don't like the principle that any organization or any community or any individual should be above the law and be separate. And I really do think that those loopholes need to eventually be closed. We need to say to faith organizations, you are entitled to believe that homosexuality is wrong. Uh, we're disappointed that you think that, but you're entitled to hold that view. But you're not entitled to use your faith as a means of discrimination. Now, discrimination is not a religious value. Even I got the Archbishop of Canterbury only four weeks ago to admit that. When I met him at Lambeth Palace, I put it to him, I said, you know, how can you acknowledge and accept the right of people to discriminate against other human beings because of their sexuality, their race, disability, their gender. And he accepted clearly that discrimination was not a religious value. And it's very interesting that he is quite clearly, from my perception, struggling to reconcile his fundamental core belief in equality with the fact that he is still upholding the traditional church view that not only are same-sex civil marriages um, not entitled to equal treatment, um, but equally he's now changed his mind about straight civil partnerships. When I met him, he agreed that straight couples should be able to have a civil partnership. And since then, sadly there appears to have been some big um, conflag within the Church of England, and he's now agreeing with the official position that they don't want straight civil partnerships either. 
Now, I do think that um, many people have, have, have argued or wondered why I have made an issue of straight civil partnerships. I think it's simply because if we truly believe in equality, it has to be equality for everyone. And just as we object to the way in which we as LGBT people are barred from marriage, equally it's wrong that straight couples should be barred from civil partnerships. There has to be a level playing field. And I think we get greater credibility and respect if we are seen to stand for not just our right to have a civil marriage, but the right of straight couples to have a civil partnership as well. That strengthens our position and makes us more credible. In terms of other issues that remain, we still have a big problem with the mistreatment of LGBT asylum seekers. Uh, refugees from deeply homophobic and transphobic countries like Iran, Uganda, Nigeria, Jamaica, Cameroon, Iraq, and so on. Um, it is really, really shocking the way in which the rate of refusal, the rate of first refusal of LGBT asylum seekers is much higher than average. You know, all asylum seekers get a raw deal, but it's particularly acute for LGBT ones. And we see time and time again this culture of disbelief that even where LGBT refugees provide written statements attesting to the persecution they've suffered, even when they provide statements from their partners or former partners, sometimes from their own family members, from people in this country who now know them as part of the LGBT community, still they are being disbelieved. Still they are being questioned. And it's particularly the case of a petite feminine woman will have her sexuality questioned. On the ground, she doesn't look like a lesbian. Um, if a woman has been married and had children, asylum adjudicators will ignore the cultural, religious, and family pressures that force so many women uh, into that situation. Um, they will not take into account uh, the cultural factors uh, that, that uh, cause women to get married and end up having children despite their own lesbian sexuality. Um, conversely, you know, I, I've heard asylum adjudicators say to a very masculine, masculine macho man, you know, you don't look gay, you know, are you certain you're gay? You, you, you know, that, that kind of question. Um, uh, refugees will also be asked, you know, um, have you been to the gay nightclub heaven? Well, for a start, uh, if, the, if, if the refugee is a woman, it's probably less likely, because it's predominantly a male club. Um, secondly, if they live in Leeds, probably not coming down all the way down to London. Um, do you read the magazine GT? Uh, some refugees can hardly read or speak English, so why would they buy a magazine? And on top of that, they are so destitute, they couldn't afford to buy it anywhere. So all these questions, um, you know, really, really mitigate and count against LGBT refugees. And it's being used in a very, very unfair way. It's become so bad that many of you have heard that increasingly, because LGBT refugees are being disbelieved, that they sometimes photograph or even film themselves having sex with their partners to provide the concrete, visible evidence. You know, this is not something they want to do. It's an incredible humiliation and intrusion on their privacy, on their, their personal life. But they feel compelled to do it because time and time adjudicators question whether they are really gay. <coughs> So that's a big, big issue, which the coalition government promised to fix and hasn't. I'll accept that the situation is better than it was. You know, I'd say that the amount of intrusive questioning, the amount of disbelief, is probably less than it was two or three years ago. That's true. Um, as you know, no longer do asylum adjudicators uh, say, go back to your home country and behave with discretion. That's been made... Uh, unlawful grounds for refusal by the High Court. But still you do get far too many cases where genuine refugees are being disbelieved. There's also, of course, the question of the interpretation and enforcement of the law. Because as we all know, it's fine and important to get equality in law, but equality in practice 
is often something different. You look at the history of the black civil rights movement in the United States, where they fought against racial discrimination. They fought against the denial of black people to be given the right to vote. They fought against segregation uh, in public facilities uh, of black and white people. And they won those battles. Yet even today in the United States, racism is endemic. Even today in the United States, the vast majority of African Americans are excluded from economic prosperity. We have a whole vast underclass of black people that is just as bad and excluded as the predecessors were in the 1950s and 60s. The gulf between very poor, <coughs> disenfranchised black people is as great today in America as it was during the 50s and 60s. And in fact, the segregation of black and white people in large parts of the United States is as bad, if not worse, than it was in <coughs> the 1950s and 60s. Um, and that's not a legally enforced segregation, it's just by white flight from suburbs and inner city areas. Um, it's about the cultural influence of racism and how it impacts. So I give you that as an example to show that we must never fall into the trap of thinking that formal legal equality is the be-all and end-all. It is a very important first step, and it's part of the process of creating a public debate. I mean, you know, whatever you think about the whole, um, the way in which the debate about same-sex marriage has been conducted, and I would say it's probably the worst homophobia we've seen in this country for, for at least a decade or two, whatever you think about it, it has been an opportunity in fighting for this legal equality to raise issues and provoke a discussion, to get people thinking and talking, and that's been valuable. So the process of law reform isn't just about law reform, it's also about conscientizing people and raising awareness. And we need that because at the end of the day, we need to win hearts and minds. And what is so gratifying is that time and time again, in the last decade or so of LGBT law reform in this country, public opinion has actually been ahead of the politicians. Way back in the early 1990s, the public, by a two-thirds majority, was saying the age of consent should be equalized. Way back then, the public, again, by a two-thirds majority, was saying LGBT people should be able to serve in the armed forces. <coughs> it took the politicians almost a decade later to catch up. And I'm sure you know that as a result of the Stonewall polls done by YouGov, that public opinion is really clearly on our side. <coughs> the YouGov poll found 71% <coughs> of the public support marriage equality, including 58% of people of faith. And the ICM poll shows that 57% of people who intend to vote conservative at the next election also support equal marriage. So the idea that this issue hasn't got public support is a nonsense. It's a fiction. This issue has more public support than almost any other issue I can think of. So I think it's a great tribute to all the many individuals and organizations all across the country who have been lobbying and campaigning for LGBT equality, not just on same-sex marriage, not just in the last year or two years or five years or ten years, but going way, 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 way back. And we owe a great debt to those pioneers in the 1950s and 60s who began this battle. I think here I, we are in Manchester, I think of the great heroic Elm Horsfall, who founded, with others, the um, Northwest Homosexual Law Reform Committee in 1964. The first grassroots uh, LGBT organization in this country. Um, a campaign that began here in Manchester and eventually was transformed in 1969 to the campaign for homosexual equality and went nationwide. Those people uh, are really, really people we must remember and respect and revere for the pioneering work they did. Not just Alan, but of course many, many others. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of Glynis Parry, you know, the secretary of the campaign for homosexual equality in the early 1970s. You know, a real iconic lesbian who did so much to speak out, articulate the battle for equal rights. She was an incredibly effective, charismatic uh, spokesperson
for our movement. Uh, Jackie Forster, um, you know, not with us any longer, uh, who pioneered um, also the lesbian struggle through Sappho and other organisations. Um, again, an incredibly pioneering, inspiring person. So we've come a long, long way. A long, long, long way. And it is extraordinary when you think that up until 1999, Britain had, by volume, the largest number of anti-gay laws of any country on earth. <laughs> extraordinary. You think, people think about decriminalisation in 1967. That was just a partial limited decriminalisation. In certain circumstances, we would not be prosecuted. But all the laws remain on the statute books. And they weren't repealed until 2003. The criminalisation of male homosexuality in Britain only ended in 2003. So who are we to lecture in Uganda and Russia and Iran and so on? A bit of humility. A bit of humility. Um, but, you know, we are there now. But when you think, the law that sent Oscar Wilde to prison in 1895, the Gross Indecency Law, remained on the statute books until 2003, categorised under the paragraph unnatural offences. So did the sodomy law, the law against anal sex, passed in the reign of King Henry VIII in 1533. It remained on the statute books until 2003. So it's only since 2003 that we have a sexuality neutral penal code governing sexual offences. And again, that's a, a fantastic, extraordinarily wonderful, marvellous achievement. A really important uh, milestone in <coughs> ending legal homophobia uh, in, in terms of uh, sexuality and sexual relationships. We also need to know, of course, that you know, having secured that change, still we have a huge problem in our schools with bullying, and harassment of LGBT kids, or those perceived to be LGBT. Because sometimes the victims are not actually LGBT, they're just thought to be LGBT. And they get stick as well. And um, although the incidence of homophobic bullying in schools has gone down, uh, it's still very substantial. About half more young kids report being bullied or witnessing homophobic bullying or transphobic bullying in their schools. And still about half of schools do not have an anti-bullying program that specifically addresses homophobic and transphobic bullying. It's getting better, that's true, it is getting better. And that we should grasp on to that uh, fact and hold, 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 hold to it. But, you know, we have a way to go yet. Um, but having said that, we've come a long way. A really long way. And it's a huge, huge tribute to all of you and thousands of other LGBT people, tens of thousands of other LGBT people around the country who've played a part. Whether it be going on a protest march, writing a letter, lobbying your MP at their surgery, whatever you've done, small or large, every single thing has helped. That's what brought us, has brought us to this place where we are today. Our cumulative collective effort. From the 1950s and 60s to this day, we have made history. We have changed this country not only for our benefit, but for the benefit of all British people. Because in the process of fighting for LGBT rights, we've challenged prejudice, we've encouraged tolerance, we've created an ethos of equality, and that benefits every single person in this country. We're on our way. Let's finish the task. Thank you.